Okay, welcome back to another episode of the Waveform Podcast. We're your hosts. I'm Marquez. And I'm Andrew. And I'm David. Hi. That was so smooth. That Thank was, you. Yeah. That was incredibly I've smooth. I've been told I'm a very smooth person. <laughs> David, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Thank uh, you. You've been on audio episodes before, but happy to have you here. We've talked about what we were going to do in this episode, which is a sort of a larger conversation or a... Uh, exploration of yeah, right to repair mm. the topic is incredibly complicated and has a lot of different perspectives and facets to it i feel like we're going to explore and dive into as many as we can but the whole point of this is to uh is to understand it better mm-hmm. and there's uh there's not a whole lot that hasn't been talked about in different places we're just bringing it all in one place here uh so if you haven't already watched the right to repair video on the main mkbsd channel do watch it it's like 20 minutes long and has some interviews in it we'll be talking about more than that and clearly for longer than 20 minutes here so this is uh this is a little extra on top anyway all right where do we even start i don't know how to start this This i okay i i want to bring up something that like got me thinking about right to repair in the first place and then had me coming out and asking you are we ever going to do that right to repair video yeah and it was actually related to the Boosted episode. So okay. if you guys haven't like heard the Boosted episode yet, you should listen to it. Um, I did some follow-up interviews after the Boosted episode. <laughs> and there are these kids. They go to this college, and they're trying to keep Boosted boards working. Uh, so I'm David, and I am the founder of XR General Hospital, and I fix Boosted boards. And they have these uh, – they basically call it a, a Boosted Hospital – where they have people that send in their boards and they fix them and they've like worked with manufacturers in China to get these parts that they only made for Boosted the company and they're trying to keep them alive. And it turns out they are really big right to repair advocates. Imaginably. So when they brought that up to me, I was like, you know, Marquez did mention he wanted to do a right to repair video. Um, Maybe this could kind of turn into something. So that's kind of what really got the wheels turning. Right. So if you haven't seen, first of all, the Boosted episode is great. It's a whole exploration of like the rise and fall of boosted boards and how that, I mean, had a really high apex and then a really low uh, trough at the bottom. But it's a really good like overall story to follow. But for me, right to repair is interesting because I, the more I look into it, especially for the video that we ended up making, the more I ended up being on the side of like it seems really, really difficult for for like any one final conclusion to work because there are two forces that are going to always be working against each other which is tech getting more and more well integrated and and better and harder and harder to repair and then people wanting to be able to repair that stuff yeah and they will always be at odds with each other and that was the part i had the hardest time with spoke to lewis rossman about it he gave me his two cents, which I really liked, which was... I just wanted to be, if you're going to glue something into the device, whatever it is, I'm willing to jump through all those hoops to, to fix it, but don't tell the company that made this part they're not allowed to sell it to me. It may seem hard to understand that this stuff is going to continue to get harder to repair, but they're up for that challenge. People who actually repair these things also evolve with the tech. Now, we were talking about this before, like, I don't know how deep that goes. Like when you're talking like soldering the memory to the sensor of a camera or or literally just combining parts that used to be three different pieces into one piece, like you could say that's done to make it obsolete later. You could say that's done to make it harder to repair, but also typically it makes it better. Like the the image processing happens faster when it's on a chip closer to the image that needs to be processed. So all this stuff is is always at odds, but I'm curious what other stuff you've dug up. Uh, maybe there's a devil's advocate side of like the <laughs> anti right to repair movement. I don't even I don't think it's even a movement. It's more of just like yeah, the conversation. the constant lobbying and and conversation from those who don't support right to repair. Yeah, I mean just to like play off your point there. I mean like IBM last week announced two nanometer processors, right? Two nanometers. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) With a whole new architecture type, so they're not even using FinFET anymore. And this is just an example of like how deeply integrated tech is getting. Like they're using ultraviolet light to create these chips because the visible light spectrum has too big of a wavelength to actually fit (laughs) transistors. (laughs) So like this is the point in which no you can't go in there and fix these things because they're thinner than a strand of DNA. It's not like 
it's not like you can go in there with tools. Right. But once we get to that point, you know, there's so many benefits. Four times better battery life with two nanometer. Your phone could last five days on a single charge. You know, it's like very, very useful. Yeah. Um, but regardless, yeah, I, I tried to I tried to talk to as many people on as many sides as we could get a hold of. Um Got lucky and was able to speak to the Julian Sanchez. I'm the director of emerging technologies at John Deere, which uh, sounds. I always find this part interesting <laughs> when like this, like we are so focused in the tech world, but tech has tech like enthusiasts and right to repair enthusiasts have like made this alliance with these farmers. And a lot of them are like, it's very based in Nebraska, it feels like. I know um, my sister-in-law is a reporter in Nebraska and they mm. cover it a ton. And just like John Deere has created the same kind of problem that we're seeing with like Apple, where it's like these farmers wanna be able to repair these machines and therefore it is stopping in a similar way Apple is. So now you don't really yeah. see farmers and tech nerds like banding together too often, but but here we are. But also everything is tech. Like when you, yeah. when I, <laughs> really. I learned so much watching those John Deere videos about how high tech those tractors are. When I think of a tractor, I just think of a thing you pour gasoline in and drive across the field. But like they have so many automated systems to the point where like they save lots of money by relying on the tech in these tractors and how how exactly the irrigation is distributing like, you know, pesticides and things like that. Like it's, it's really high tech stuff. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. In 2021, you can find a tech argument or a tech angle to almost everything. So it almost doesn't surprise me that tractors are looped into that. Which is why, like, this general discussion right now is going to have such big precedent for the future. Um, and I think the reason it becomes such a discussion and the reason we really dove into it, other than you talked to the people with Boosted, it brought up the conversation. We all sat down one day and had, like, a three-hour conversation about what we were. Yeah. Because, like... It's really hard to pick one side. There's, I think most of us would lean towards the right to repair side, obviously, but there's a lot of times when these bigger companies bring up points that total, are hard to argue. Exactly. It's really, really hard to argue some of those points. So that's why I think we reached out to all these different yeah. people to try and get a, a better idea from people in the the realm of what's going on. You want to get a more balanced you know, viewpoint, mm -hmm. right? Because it's like, I obviously, like you said, we we're all going to kind of like, lean towards right to repair. Yeah. But talking to the CTO of John Deere, I was like, oh, wow. Like the amount of things that are benefited by the amount of technology that they put in these tractors. And first of all, I just want to say like, I loved that it we ended up taking this like tractor angle because when you think of tech and then you think of farming, I think that's not the first thing that comes to mind. It, no. It's not a, but then you say like everything is tech and it's like, Oh, yeah. And a really good point that um, the CTO brought up to me was that farming is kind of a unique industry because this is one of the great things about agriculture, which is that uh, environmental sustainability and profitability are actually one and the same. In a lot of space, in a lot of spaces, you have to sort of sacrifice something in order to get environmental sustainability. In farming, if you can ultimately get to a point where you don't have to apply or use as much stuff, you are making money and you are benefiting the environment. So they actually have a benefit, like they have this incentive mm -hmm. to optimize better. And farming is all about optimization, right? Like how much water exactly can you use to get the most crops possible? He told me that one of their tractors that they have right now can use AI to determine what is a weed and what is a plant while it is driving over these crops and then it will only spray the pesticides on the weeds, and they save 90% of the pesticides that they were spraying mm. before they used this tractor with this AI, which is insane. And it, again, it's like good for the environment, way less yeah, pesticides. Exactly. It saves the farmers tons of money. This, um, is, this is why it was hard for me, because like I, like I, I fall on the side of, yes, we should have right to repair, and that's where I landed with the video. But I also want tech to get better. Exactly. Like I want yeah. that 90% savings and I want the obvious benefits that come with optimization to be available to all and to keep moving forward. So like all of those arguments that I fully understand, like it's it's easy to take a side if you work for one of these companies yeah, absolutely. of the other yeah, side. Yeah, yeah. So I can imagine if you work for not just John Deere, but you know Tesla or Apple or any number of companies that... As Lewis, as Lewis Rossman would put it, pretty much every company has some sort of anti-right-to-repair stance. Um, I could see how they would land on the, 
don't you want us to make our stuff better? Yeah. Don't you want those savings? Don't you want the tech to continue to move forward? That's going to be their argument every time, and that's why it's hard to argue right. against it. Yeah. But us on the other side, we're like, well, the screen breaks. I don't want to have to yeah. throw the whole thing out. Yeah, it's 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 really interesting because uh, you know I was kind of pressing him on like because we watched these videos from like Motherboard did a video on like uh, this movement with these farmers to get the tractors more uh, repairable. I guess I guess the the main problem that they have right now is that these tractors at this point are all very integrated. Like we talked about earlier, like the more integrated, the better the technology gets, and so because of this, um, their sensors all over the tractor, they can determine if things are going wrong and they can throw error codes. And if they throw specific error codes, you can't really use the tractor until you bring it into a service center or what he said is that a service center agent will actually get dispatched out to you because they also have LTE. And as soon as it Mm. noticed that there is an issue, it will send a text message to the farmer and say, hey, this has an issue that needs to be worked on by a service person. Do you want us to dispatch someone right now or do you want to bring it in? There's a lot of cases where the dealer will call the customer ahead of time and say, hey, have you seen the trouble code? Oh, no, I'm really busy. OK, well, we saw it and there's there is a repair person on the way to to help you out. Um, so that's that's kind of crazy, too. And what these farmers are basically pushing for is like they don't want to have to deal with the time it takes to have one of exactly. these out of commission. But something that, and I'm, again, I'm playing devil's advocate. I don't want to be like a, just a marketing mouthpiece for John Deere. No, we, well, let's let be clear Deere about that. Talking, for sure. um, but he did tell me that 95% of the problems on the tractors can be fixed with just standard tools and you don't need anybody out there. Like he said, the tractor is able to determine problems with like if you have a leaky um, hose of some kind, that like a pressure hose. It knows that that is leaky because it's not getting certain pressure readings off of this pressure sensor, and you can replace that with any third-party part. He said 90, 95 times out of 100, you are able to fix that as a farmer. It's just when you get these specific error, error codes where like things are a bigger problem, and their worry there is like if you've seen these tractors <laughs> – like at CES, they have these oh, tractors yeah. that they started. Um, they're bigger than this room. They're freaking yeah. massive. They are so big. And like you don't want to risk the chance of like, you know, something major malfunctioning because it's a very computerized thing and they run themselves and they are self-driving. They're like autopilot tractors. Yeah. Like at, at this point, it is just an operator sitting in the seat that kind of pivots like you're in a starship or something. Mm-hmm. And you're not even really pressing anything. You're just making sure that you're not running over anything terrible. Because he said something that's kind of funny that they have not yet figured out. is Uh, There are no systems at the moment in uh, commercialized that are doing obstacle recognition and therefore avoidance. They have self-driving, but like if you've got like, I don't know, a barrel in the field or something, it'll just run right over it. (laughs) Okay. I got to work on that one. (laughs) So they've got all this technology, but they don't have that, which is kind of funny. Um, But anyway, yeah, no, I would love to hear you guys' thoughts on that. I mean. Yeah, when I okay, so we can go. We'll start with the tractor stuff. I feel like uh, obviously I'm not a farmer, so I'm not going to have the farmers most only educated opinion about <laughs> what tractors should and shouldn't do. But no, it makes a lot of sense. I I keep hearing that as soon as something goes down, farmers are dealing with the downtime, but they're also dealing with the amount of money it takes them to bring the tractor into wherever that service center for John Deere is to have it fixed and then to get it all the way back. It could be thousands of dollars. And so if the farmer had the ability to fix any and every problem, that would help their business, that would help their their downtime, everything would be better for the farmer. John Deere sees it as a liability, the way I understand it, where if someone does go into those 5% of problems where it really shouldn't be touched by someone who doesn't know what they're doing, and then they hurt themselves or they damage the whole tractor, then it looks bad to John Deere, and now John Deere has to deal with even more stuff, so they just want to limit that liability, which yeah. is what companies do. I get it. Um, so I don't even, again, I don't have a conclusion or a side to take. It's just like that's the way it's going to look from yeah. that side. I think it's always going to be maybe not easy, but there will always be an argument because even if it's 95% of the time, even if John Deere's customer service is incredible, there's going to be a time where that 5% happens on a really bad day for that farmer that they need their stuff right away, they're on a really bad time crunch, it's going to happen and they can't wait for that. And if they they know if they had the tools, they could fix it. And no matter what, 
no matter how good everyone works, those complaints are going to be pushed to the front. And yeah. we're always going to see that as an issue. Yeah. And the minute one farmer talks to all their other farmers, I mean, this isn't just farmers. This is people using <laughs> iPhones. This is people using yeah. computers. Like, if I have a problem with something and I can't get it fixed right away or I get inconvenienced, I'm going to complain to everybody. Yeah, no, it's it's this weird balance, right? Because obviously if you're using 90% less pesticides, you are much more fuel efficient because it is, you know, driving itself. So you're not driving over the same path multiple times. Or like this is all optimization. So you have to balance like that potential downtime that you're going to have yeah. with the benefit of like how much extra crop are you going to have? And it just becomes this like, sure, this is going to be very difficult to deal with like twice a year. Yeah. But all the benefits that you're getting from that, like does that outweigh that potential downtime you have? I I want to pivot to Tesla because I think this can kind of encapsulate a bunch of versions of this. And of course, I like talking about Tesla all the time. So, you know, here we are. <laughs> um, so I my first car was a, uh, was a hybrid it was a Toyota Camry hybrid, right? And when I was shopping for cars, one of the things I kept hearing from dealerships was if you have a regular gas car and something breaks, it's pretty easy and pretty good chance that you're going to find a way to fix that. Now, obviously, you can do oil changes and you can do simple fixes. But if, uh, if something breaks in the gas car, there's going to be someone at a shop nearby who can know what to do with it. And if you get a hybrid, they kept telling me this, if you get a hybrid not too many people are going to want to touch that. There's just way more electrical in there. If you get a Prius, if you get a camera hybrid, any of these things, like you'll have better mileage. You'll have an overall better car. It's more fuel efficient and all these things will be better about it. You have eco mode. You have like an electric only mode. But if something breaks, no one's going to really want to touch it. And then my next car was electric and it's the extreme end of that, which is if literally anything breaks whether it's something with the computer or the electrical or the motors or the battery or any other or part like of this car. Like a panel of the car, yeah. No one in any regular third-party shop is going to want to touch that. Mm -hmm. You have to go back to Tesla. Mm -hmm. But it's the best car I've ever had. Right. Is that trade-off the... worth it yeah. to people? I'm doing air quotes for audio listeners. Is that worth it? Hmm. And I think one of the potential questions is, are these newer, more high-tech, more well-integrated things breaking less often than the previous older things that were easier to fix? So if something's 10 times harder to repair, but only breaks one out of every, you know, one-tenth of the amount of times that the old school stuff broke, is it worth the trade-off? Right. I'm curious what you guys think of that. Yeah, and I think this is a conversation that we had for like three hours in the office because you can take anything to the nth degree, right? So if we're, if we're like, okay... Uh, you have these future M M5 Max mm -hmm. that are so integrated. They use two nanometer everything, and like the processor is like you know this big, but like everything is so deeply integrated. But because it's so deeply integrated, individual modules don't really break, mm -hmm. and the whole thing falls apart one one hundredth of the time. But then you do just have to buy a new one if it breaks down. It's like where does that trade off become useful? And it becomes profitable for the company. But it's also pro when does it be also become profitable for the consumer? Because the whole point of right to repair is yeah, you don't want to lose money by having to replace a whole thing instead of just a part. Exactly, but if it's I, more cost effective, I think that that like curve. <laughs> I don't know how to explain this, but it it's lands somewhere in the value of that thing to you. So if it's my phone, and you told me you could have an unbreakable phone, but or an almost unbreakable phone but an almost completely un unrepairable phone, I would take that. Yeah. But if you told me I have to have a car or something I rely on every day and I can't quickly get a new one, and it's almost unbreakable, but if it does break, you just have to get rid of that car, I would be less likely to take that risk. So I'm saying if it's a more disposable thing, I'm willing to price. take that. Price yeah, the is price. pretty much, yeah. if it's a If it's a lower value thing, I'm, I'm willing to sacrifice the right to repair. But if it's a high value thing, I still want that ability to repair, I think. I, I think one thing, though, in this this debate about more unbreakable versus more repairable is user error that we're not talking about right now. Because in all these situations, that makes perfect sense if the phone's used correctly or whatever. But how many broken screens are there? How many 
destroyed corners or charging ports get destroyed from somebody or and yes i know we will get to the point where that's getting harder and harder to break but i guarantee you we will break them or with a car like you're uh, like a tesla makes perfect sense there are way few moving parts so if you use your car perfectly all the time it will most likely outlast a motor i mean we haven't gotten official stuff on that but chance there's way less things to do so it's easier to mess up but it, you can mess it up and when you do or Yours wasn't even your fault. A tractor trailer sideswiped you. Yeah. No other car would take two months to fix that part. Right. But Interesting. Because it happened, that did. There's there's always this user error aspect of it. And I feel like a probably I'd love to ask Lewis, how many things does he get brought into him, tech wise at least, that are because Apple messed up and it broke, or because a user messed up and it broke? So yeah, I when we talk about user error, we are just, you know. Talking about how many of the repairs do you think are happening because somebody did something wrong and their thing broke mm -hmm. or just because they were using it like it was perfectly intended to and it just happened to break? I would be so curious about those ratios in a bunch of different like industries. Yeah, exactly. Because I feel like cars, like obviously you hit something, you're going to have to get your car repaired. Mm -hmm. But you're right. But if you drive a Tesla the exact same way that you drive a normal gas car, the brake pads on the Tesla will last 50, 100 times as long because you don't use brake pads nearly as much because of regenerative braking from the motors. So the brake pads are just rated to last the lifetime of the car, which is insane. There's just one less moving part, one less thing to have to replace or break or fix that. I mean, they still have brake pads because you don't always regenerative brake, but mm -hmm. it's just one less part that is likely to eventually reach the end of its life in your car. And that's the type of thing that I think cars of the future are going to continue to improve on. There's going to be more things where it's like, well, cars in the past used to have a whole moving steering wheel inside the car, and now we don't have those anymore because they would break eventually, I guess. Um, bad example, but I was going to say, wait, being, wait, yeah, nobody where breaks their do steering we not wheels. Have, yeah, okay, nobody breaks sorry. their steering wheels, but I'm sure there's lots of switches inside that are, that people are like breaking off where plastic would break. But that's the that's the inevitable future. Is like, okay. Cars are just going to keep getting more and more well integrated and they will ideally last longer and longer. But if they ever have something that breaks because of user error, they will immediately be subject to a way longer process of going back to the manufacturer versus a regular gas car where you could have fixed it yourself. Right. So that that is an exact example of uh, when I talked to Fairphone, something that they're trying to fix. Ah, uh, okay. So it's funny that you bring up like user error and system error because at some point they almost kind of converge, right? Every single year Apple releases a new iPhone, they always talk about how the screen is better. It's less shatter resistant, right? That's like a combination more of- sh More shatter resistant. Or more shatter okay, resistant. In theory, yes. anyway. Yeah, in theory. Yeah. You know, it's like they're talking about like it, it will crack less and all this stuff. And it becomes like a feature of the phone. So in that way, it's also like a, a feature, but then it's also user area when you break it. So I don't, either way. Uh, Fairphone was really interesting to talk to. They actually contacted us after um, the Right to Repair video went live because they wanted to chat about their phone. Uh, they're this company from Amsterdam and they make phones that are supposed to be as basically like repairable as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, they are not the newest phones. I think the newest one is still running on Android 10 and they use like generally lower end Qualcomm processors. Um, but for people who like really care about like replacing individual things in their phones, they make it really easy. So you can either swap out the screen. Everything is, it's almost like Project Aura in a way from Google, if yeah, you guys I'm remember that. Yeah, looking at the site, yeah. Okay. Very similar, like they have these modules. Um, the Fairphone 3 Plus is actually just the Fairphone 3, but they released some updated camera modules. So if you don't want to buy a 3 Plus, you can actually swap out the cameras mm -hmm. in the 3, and then you have a 3 Plus, right? So anything that breaks or if things get better, you can sort of just upgrade it almost like a PC. But then, again, you get that downside of, okay. I, and I asked him in particular, I was like, well, a lot of people replace their phones because they start to feel slow, right? And if you're using these like mid-ranged older Qualcomm processors, like are people are really going to be mm -hmm. excited about that? I mean, a big part of the marketing in like any new chipset launch or any new phone launch is how much faster the new processor, the best processor we've ever made, right? Um, but Fairphone wants to take a different approach. And this was really interesting to me. They said, ideally, they would like their customers to have one of their phones for seven years. Even with spare parts, even with having to change your battery after two years and a half uh, and doing the, the some upgrades uh, when you want, you still end up in those 30% uh, reduction. If we even push it to seven years, which 
may sound super crazy, but it's technologically not impossible, we think. You would be talking about 45% reduction. And that's using the same type of phones, right? We're only talking about extending the use, uh, the use phase. Because the refresh cycle of general phones is like two to three now. And mm. you know, if you're a, a real tech head, you replace your phone like every year. So they want people to use these phones and they're like, okay, my screen broke, I'll buy a new screen module, slap it on. My camera broke, I'll buy a new camera module, slap it on. Right. Um, but again, you've got all these downsides, which is like, you can't make it faster. They do guarantee five years of software updates. Okay. But they said only when it's needed. So it's That's not also a hard like, guarantee when you want seven year life to not guarantee. Yeah, seven and year. also and also like a chipset doesn't necessarily support, you know, the software that long. So it's kind of a it's it's a weird thing. A a big part of the way they made the company is because they are actually trying to make the world like more sustainable. He brought mm -hmm. up this good point of the fact that like So if you if you look at the at the whole um ecosystem of materials um, every year only around 10 percent actually less so there's some reports that said like somewhere between nine and ten percent of material that is used in industry and in all the different industries not only in the consumer electronics industry only ten percent gets recycled so the other 90 percent is just stuff that ends up either in hibernation eh? so in the drawers in our homes or in a landfill, but it does not get recycled. And this is, so every year, I just want to make this picture, every year 90% comes from the ground, uh, from a mine, let's say, and gets landfill to make it super simplistic. It does not get recycled. The amount of devices that we have just sitting in our drawers and stuff, not being utilized when they could be utilized, and then other people are going out and buying new things. But there's there's actually a cobalt shortage right now, which is this rare earth metal that's used in a lot of batteries and a lot of devices, and it's just using a ton of devices. And they've been working really, really hard to try to make the mines of these cobalt mines like have better working conditions and to get more value out of the mines while also like treating the people better because obviously it's like really mm -hmm. bad, not great. And it's 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 we're at this point where it's like kind of sad because we have all these devices sitting in our drawers that have cobalt in them. And if you you can recycle, I think he said about 90, 80 to 90% of the mm -hmm. cobalt in devices pretty effectively. And yet there's a, a shortage when we have all these devices, every single person has an old phone or an old this or that oh, yeah. that has cobalt in it. It creates a lot of waste and being in that kind of environmentalist front um, as an architecture student, I have to worry a lot about where these products that I'm using for my education go. It's kind of antithetical. If I'm, you know, practicing sustainable building and sustainable uh, design, I need to make sure that the things I'm using do not contribute to something that I'm trying to stop. Yeah, this is really curious to me. I'm going to try to make a, an analogy, but it will see if it works or not. But I think it's really interesting that they still, despite being modular, expect it to last seven years and then you get rid of it. And I wonder what that limiting factor is. Is it just because it's going to get too slow after seven years and won't support the software anymore? Or is it just because, pe well, the other thing is how many people want to buy a phone that isn't as performant because it will be more repairable in the future? Um, and you're talking about how there's so much cobalt in the world, but it's inside of gadgets that we don't use anymore. And I'm thinking like, I remember when I get like a, a notebook for school and I would like take notes on like half the pages. And then once the class was over, I didn't need to take notes on it anymore. And I just got rid of that notebook. I didn't use the last 50 pages in the book. They're perfectly usable blank mm. pages, but I just don't feel the need to use those because they're part of something I'm done using. Right. And it's like, is there going to be any way to get people to want to use their old gadgets, to want to repair, to want to take advantage of these extra resources we know we have? Or do people just want the newest thing no matter what? It feels like that's kind of yeah, where we're at. Yeah, and it's, it's like where capitalism is at. I think that's what, you know, people always want the newest thing. Yeah. It's just that conversation was so interesting to me because it's another angle of right to repair. There's so many angles now. There's the like... You should be able to do whatever you want with the devices you own. There's the you should be able to fix anything and have access to the parts that the manufacturers have. And then there's also the sustainability angle of like yeah. we are destroying our planet by just like replacing our devices constantly. And so that's like that's like three or four different major angles to to this idea. Yeah. And I think that's also 
a little, I don't want to say it's downfall, but a reason why the messaging has not been really loud. Yeah, it's not, it's not as easy to lump everything into one easy to adjustable sentence, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, can we talk about the printer thing from that yeah, video? Yeah, sure. I just want to yeah. I just want to bring this up because we we do research for videos and it just takes us down random paths. And I just felt the need to tell people about this. Okay, so the example we used in the beginning of the right to repair video: Can you do anything you want with the thing you own? And you buy an object, you get to use it however you want. But if you buy like a potentially dangerous object, you can't use it to harm people. That's against the law. But like, what if you just buy a printer? You can just do whatever you want with the printer, right? You can put it on whatever table in any room you want. You can plug it in in any outlet you please. Like no Connect one's going to stop you. Connect it to any Wi-Fi. If yeah, it maybe. feels like it. That's Potentially. It. <laughs> <laughs> but you get it working and you can just go ham. Get whatever paper you want. Print on napkins. Print on regular paper. Print red, white, and blue. Whatever. I wouldn't suggest napkins. Yeah, that I wouldn't suggest like- it, but like <laughs> you can if you want to. Um, but if you try to photocopy money, currency... Legal tender, it actually won't let you do it or print either, like or print it yeah. at all. And that's because the printer, well, not the printer, so it is illegal to print money. And so the printer companies have built in a way of recognizing when some sort of legal tender is being printed or photocopied. There's actually a really specific dot pattern that has a name that appears on many major currencies. And they're all like you can find it on the dollar and the euro and every every like piece of paper money has this dot pattern. And you can just put that dot pattern on a piece of paper and it won't print it. Hmm. So if you try to photocopy some money, like some printers will throw up an error message on the screen like I won't do this. Some will get halfway through, then see the dot pattern, then blank the rest of the page. So you get like half a dollar bill. It's really interesting seeing this happen. But this isn't because like there is some physical limitation of the printer. This is something that you bought, that you own, that is perfectly capable of doing this thing, but they're not going to let you because they don't want to have that liability on themselves. Somebody printed money with an Epson printer and now Epson looks bad. So I don't know. That's just like a random uh, quirk of like the the ownership. Like we all think of ownership as being able to do whatever you want that it is physically able to do. And if you're able to repair the thing, physically speaking, I'm just going to do it. No one should be able to stop me. Uh, but that's that's there's no, yet another wrinkle in that because there's always going to be people trying to stop you to do, trying to stop you from doing things that you should be able to do. Yeah, it's it's funny um, that photocopy thing actually even transcends to a lot of photo editing software. I tried to open a ten dollar yeah. bill in Photoshop, and oh, it, yeah. it throws this random error code that references this law from like the '80s or something. Yeah. It makes uh, perfect sense. Like you, and if you draw, if you drag a PNG of money into Photoshop, it goes. Ah, I'm not touching this. You can't mm-hmm. have this in a layer. Mm-hmm. It's funny because we, we were doing a video on a $300 phone, I think, and I had $200 bills for the thumbnail. I needed one more, and I was like, "All right, we'll just Photoshop. Like, we'll just copy another one because I can't. I can't print money, obviously. So we'll just make another one." And we couldn't even do that. I forgot how we actually figured that out. I don't remember either. Yeah. But that that's just such a random it's a great niche. yeah no i mean <laughs> it's that's another it's like that's a whole nother angle to right to repair too is like the the ability to do whatever you want with the things you you own right and that's i think that's what these um the farmers are angry at that is a lot of people who you know there's these stories about people who put the autopilot stuff on their teslas and it's like they shouldn't be doing that and the car gets mad at them and then Tesla doesn't want to be liable when people hurt themselves. But then you were talking to Simone, right? And she said that like... Yeah, the, the project got so much traction that it would like look really bad for them to go after me. But it's also like, I, I mean, I, I remember um, scheduling a service appointment because I wasn't, I had some software issues. And the service tech before I came in called and was like, hey... I know who you are and I know what you've done to your car. <laughs> and I was like And I was so freaked out that I actually didn't go. And it's kind of weird that like you're scared of a company punishing you for doing something with their product. Simone's story is interesting. Uh so if you haven't seen seen what Simone did with her Model 3, which she still drives by the way, which is amazing, uh she took the back half of off of it and turned it into a pickup truck. Like, I still get alarms going off in my car being like, hey, your seatbelt in the rear seat isn't plugged in. And I'm like, there is no rear seat. That's what you don't know. 
and the project is great and they wanted to keep as much of the structural integrity of the original Model 3 as possible. But like you see that thing driving around on the street and you're like, I've never seen anything like that before. <laughs> it's so cool. Um, but when you go to that length to modify your car, sawing off beams and like putting other truck parts in there, obviously that's not covered under any sort of warranty. Not only that, but it'll probably be strongly discouraged by Tesla. Um, and whenever something happens to a Tesla that is against their like terms of use, basically, they have every right to shut that car off of software updates, to blacklist that car's VIN number from supercharging, to do whatever they want to essentially discourage the continued use of that car, and also probably safety. Um, they didn't do any of that with Simone's car. They still let her supercharge. She still gets software updates. The only thing it does is it keeps pinging her to buckle the back seat of the car, but there is no back seat of the car. Uh, but that's yeah. just a funny, like, okay, if Tesla sees this one project and it's really good PR and they don't want to do anything about it, they yeah. don't have to. But at the same time, if you're somewhere in the middle, if you're somewhere in, I just want to, I don't know, chop out the back seats of my car and put in different back seats. Yeah. Like, I don't think they're going to want right. you to do that, and there's there's a very good chance they have a good reason for you to not do that. It's like the farmers are they don't they don't like that they physically can't use their tractor when it throws these error codes. That's that's the biggest issue for them is like they are like I bought this. Why does it just not work now? And I don't have control over that. And that's what they like very much dislike. But it's the exact same thing as Tesla, where like it could be a major safety concern because these these like tractors are freaking huge. So really, it's this conversation of like. Do you have the right to be dangerous with the stuff that you bought from other people? Yeah. That's kind of like What's the, the argument risk level? there. Yeah. Also, to take it back to printers, which are not risky at all, why can't you print things with black ink when you're out of yellow ink? <laughs> like, seriously. <laughs> that's like- Big printer. It's it's completely physically possible for me to change the text in my document to blue and print it in blue, and I'm out of black ink, just print it in blue, and it's like, I can't print anything right now. <laughs> like, why? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Big printer, uh, man. Um, to go back, though, on, like, we're talking about safety. The, I think the safety excuse for the companies makes way more sense for, like, Tesla and John Deere because those are things that not only can, like, can hurt the, the users but, like, potentially hurt other people. So I think that's about this. a little – this is a little harder when it comes to an iPhone. Yes, there are battery issues, obviously, <laughs> yeah. that can cause damage. But a lot of iPhone, MacBook – I shouldn't just say that. There, there's plenty of, you know, computer, smartphone, general consumer goods – they're a lot less dangerous if something bad were to happen. Yes, you can get in a battery that explodes, but like that's much different than a Tesla like not being able to break as it's flying down the highway. So right. it's a, it's a, yeah. it's very different. Yeah, so I find that excuse much harder by these big tech companies to to throw out there. This is actually it's one of the things I saw a lot in the YouTube comments section. Still valuable to this day, um, which was that basically everything is dangerous. That was their argument where they'd say, all right, Tesla won't let you dig into like, you know, snipping wires and getting into the batteries of the car because you might hurt yourself, but anyone can change their brakes. Anyone can do a tire rotation. And if you mess that up, you will crash and hurt at least yourself, but probably more people. So maybe Tesla shouldn't have that excuse. If you can go into your iPhone, you can probably break the battery and that will hurt you a lot. Like everything is dangerous was their argument. So there should not be any right to repair like division between non-dangerous and dangerous things their argument is everything can hurt somebody probably well, even printers <laughs> and you should just not be able to repair anything or you should be able to repair everything it's it's one or the other i don't i mean it's hard to argue that that logic but i think generally <laughs> my assumption would be a lot of these companies use safety as yeah. oh, a nicer way of them saying we don't want the bad PR for something that liability. happens. What, yeah, yeah. yeah like it's what? like it's much more image based on them than it is on them caring about. If you like, this sounds pretty bad, but I'm sure a lot of these companies care more about the article that says someone died because of their product and less about the actual person right. dying right. about. Yeah, it's just it's definitely it's funny that Tesla will let you change your wheels as much as you want, totally allowed, and you can mess up a couple bolts and the wheel falls off, and like that's definitely going to hurt some people. But there's just like a level of risk that Tesla's calculated that they're willing to accept before they will straight up like blacklist your car and you they, you shouldn't touch the stuff on that side of the spectrum. I think that's the specific point where it becomes user error versus manufacturer yeah, error. Yeah, right. Like imagine if Tesla didn't let you change your wheels. That would just be like ha z literal zero 
customization by the person. Like, would you yeah. could you like, say they have control over? Could they theoretically ever have control over your wheels? That's the thing. I mean, I guess they could physically. I'm sure no. they could find a way. I mean, I'm sure they could find a way. Yeah, because there's always tools for you to do whatever. Like they, there. If I want to go in and remove the computer and put in a different one, I physically could do that with yeah. enough screws and, and wires, but like it's not going to work. But all they would have to do is find some sort of sensor that doesn't get triggered when you change the wheel and then bricks the car. Yeah, I mean, there's a potentially, couple. Potentially. I'm just saying we, wheels are like a pretty standard thing. I think we've all come to the, the understanding that wheels, at, at least at this point, we don't know in the future, are something that users change all the time they're low risk they're very low risk exactly change them all the time with a low percent of failure and that's good yeah so like a certain number of things people don't change all the time with that low of a risk and that's where they yeah so change your computer out in your tesla yeah all right well i want to talk about some of the like final like the conclusion type stuff that's actually happening around right to repair so probably the number one thing that's come up especially in youtube comment sections and it came up in our research but it didn't make it into the 20 minute video is the right to repair or the re repairability scores that we're starting to see. And I think there's specifically ratings given to products in, correct me if I'm wrong, is it France? It's that France. has stickers on boxes now? Yep. Can you explain what's happening there? Yeah, so I talked to Taylor from iFixit and he brought this up. And then also when I was talking to Fairphone, they also brought this up. But basically... I'm not sure if you know about France's new repair scoring system that they just implemented. So. In France, they just came out with uh, a whole repairability scoring system that uh, uh, manufacturers are required to uh, score their own product based on the availability of parts, uh, how hard the thing is to disassemble. Um, and so France legally obligates every company within certain categories to do uh, this, to, to assign this repair score. Right now, this is only in France, um, but it's kind of populating throughout the EU slowly. And the EU actually seems a lot more willing to put these kind of legislation pieces into place. This is something we talked about at the very end of our video, right? It was like, what are the next steps? Legislation has got to be the next thing. Yeah, I know in the States, uh, it's much more like per uh, state, actually. Uh, in, in the EU, we have this new Green Deal from, I think it's already one year and a half uh, ago. And there's this uh, circular economy package that is being put into place. So I think steps are being done really, uh, uh, really fast here when it comes to legislation, but also, um, yeah, let's say putting a pushing a little bit the, 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 the brands to have that responsibility into the market. But in France, they actually have these repairability scores that have to go on certain electronics. So right now it's not on everything. It's on like smartphones and laptops and things that you would think would have potentially some replaceable parts. Um, but effectively, there's it's a score from one to ten. Even though there's there's like it's tech, there's decimals, so it's technically one to a hundred. Mm -hmm. But you have a very strict list of things like okay, how repairable is the screen? How repairable is this part? How repairable is this part? And then right now, the manufacturers themselves are the ones that give themselves a score, which doesn't seem great. Uh, he did say that France tried to make these as robust as possible so that you couldn't like cheat. But you know, if something was between a 4.6 and a 4.7, good chance they're going to give it a 4.7. But um, turns out this is actually having a lot of impact on consumers, which is not something I I necessarily I expected that. But I guess if you think about like. I would like to know how much those like uh, warnings on cigarette packages. Like, if you've seen the the cigarette warnings in like Australia, they're like, "You are going to die if you yeah. smoke these." In big bold letters, your lungs will explode. It's and a this is a picture of it. It's a similar thing. So, like, these scores are not only saying like, "Hey, by the way, you'll be able to keep this thing longer because you can fix it," but also that it's better for the environment. And apparently, that's actually having a really big impact on consumers. Really? Okay, I was gonna ask. There's there's so many. I have so many questions about <laughs> yeah. this. Oh, yeah. um, okay, number one. So how do they decide what gets a score and what doesn't? Because you said this is smartphones and computers and things that should have replaceable parts, but that's been a moving goal over time. Like today, it's easy to put smartphones and laptops on one side of that line and maybe smaller accessories. I'm just going to say headphones, for example, on the other side of that line. But 
40 years ago, the line was over here. Right. So I guess the line's here today, but does, does that law define what gets a score? I don't know. Like, what's a computer? <laughs> <laughs> Not really sure about that. But um, the other is, as you said, the companies yeah. make their own scores. How do you define a 5 out of 10 repairability? Is it just for how many parts of the phone so are replaceable? So they have replaceable? a checklist. They have a checklist of like, can you replace this part? Can you replace this part? Can you replace this part? And that's why it's based on product category right now. Okay. It's like laptops versus phones versus this. And it's kind of like it's kind of like YouTube, right? Like there are so many hours of video uploaded per second that you cannot physically have enough human beings on the earth to do this. It's obviously scaled down for product launches, but there are a lot of products that are being launched all the time. Yeah. You can't have someone from France that is paid to do this full time because they will never catch up. So this makes me think like if I am a company, I am immediately planning on maximizing my score and probably trying to do whatever I can, despite the product's lack of repairability, to maximize my score. Yeah. And I'm trying to think, because like in a uh, in the EPA rating for how many miles per gallon your car gets, there's a standard test, and you you run through the test, and companies have tried to cheat this test, but yeah. you eventually land on a standardized score. I'm wondering if there's going to be parts that are technically replaceable but that there are no available replacements for mm. it like where you'll technically right. be able to say yes you can do you can replace the charge part with three easy screws but we won't sell you that yeah like they'll get a high repairability score despite not really you know making a better product for right to repair you know what's funny is when i asked i was fairphone about this and they said that most companies in like europe are like happy to sell you the the parts like he 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 was actually kind of surprised or I mean he knows about Apple obviously but when I asked him that I was like so theoretically because I asked him do you guys have like repair centers for people that don't want to repair their phones even though it's fairly easy with Fairphone he was like yeah we have one repair center in uh, in France and I was like okay well like what about third parties you know do they have access to these parts and he was like well we're a small company we only have 200,000 customers right now but yeah, why not? In the end, then a Fairphone will be repaired faster and uh, uh, a customer will be happy again. So why not? I mean, if we scaled up over the size of Apple, we'd happily give every part we have available to a third party because that just means more people using our phones. Like he seems like perplexed that I was asking this question. I I love that philosophy. I don't think it scales. Yeah. Like if you are or Apple. It's easy to say at least when you're small scale. Yeah, yeah, because when you get to these bigger companies who are rightfully, arguably anti-competitive where they are in ruthless competition where if they do make parts available and they do have to deal with more liability and more headlines, that's worse for them. Yeah. So they have more incentive to not allow that sort of stuff to happen and just just send us back your phone and we'll fix it for you for 150 bucks. Like that's what the bigger, more competitive companies are going to do. So yeah, I guess it, I'm not surprised that a company like Fairphone or at least position like Fairphone is perfectly happy to sell you parts and be a, a, an advocate for right to repair. But I'm, I'm so curious about those stickers and like how many companies are specifically going to try to maximize their score while not actually doing anything good for right to repair. Yeah, I think, I think everyone is obviously always trying to optimize their score, but it, it did. I did get a general sense that in the EU, it is at least more of a consideration than it is here. And I think that is backed up by the fact that legislation passes more easily. Whether or not we like it, I think the legislation that passes is kind of like a distilled sense of what the people in that area care about. And obviously, people here, they care about the environment. They care about right to repair. But they're not like loud about it, you know, and in the EU, people are louder about it. And that's why they only sell phones in the EU right now. <laughs> so on the score, you're saying there's like a checklist and it's based on if you can repair it. Does it have anything to do with who can repair it? That's, in that that sense? would be something I'd have to look up. Because I like, tell you that, that right like the first thing I can think of is, yeah, Apple can maximize their score. They can repair everything. You just have to do it through them. And whether that is going to delete everything on your storage in the process or Lewis has talked about, and I, I don't remember the exact specifics, but there's certain components in a MacBook where if you, Apple were to try and replace that, they would say they can't recover anything from your hard drive where he has ways 
where, or at least he digs a little deeper and can find different ways that might actually be able to save you like all the information you had, which is super, super important to a lot of people. So the, the score sounds fantastic. I do agree with you that I, I'm sure outside of the U S I bet people care about that score a little much. I would, I'd like to see if anyone gave it. But it's also about it bold on the front of the packaging. I think that actually does make a big difference. I, I would love to see it. That might like be the I, most important part of the legislation. Like yeah. If, yeah. if everyone's required to give a mile per gallon, but then nobody has to tell you what it is versus it's in the sticker on the window, like that number is going to mean something. So you might not care at all about repairability, but when you get to the store and you you know this new legislation passes and suddenly there's two phones next to each other, one of them says 3 out of 10, one of them says 8 out of 10, maybe you are swayed a little bit. Yeah, a little okay. bit. And, and this almost comes... I, sorry, we'll let you talk in one second. Yeah. This almost comes back to... We had this conversation before about like reviews and like how people... like Micro differences in reviews on Amazon. Something's a 4.7, something's a 4.6. Mm-hmm. Always going to go with that 4.7. Yeah. Like it's, it's the things that are in the consumer peripherals. That has a big influence on what they buy. I think what I would specifically be interested in though is Apple obviously sells their phones in their own stores somebody who's not us we would all kind of understand what a a repairability score is most people would not they would immediately ask a question and now who's the person they're asking the question to the apple employee that's inside the apple store oh how is that going so what about the verizon store you know if if the iphone has a three (laughs) you're assuming the verizon store actually has any customer support at all oh sorry bad joke in the u.s people buy their phones no no yeah yeah no no, exactly (laughs) so i'm thinking i'm just saying if they're actually helpful oh oh, yeah yeah, yeah. (laughs) but like if you if you're just looking at the box or looking at the sticker which I, i think it's a nice like understandable logo it's an out of 10 rating clearly that's cool but yeah, like what? I do think if they saw a lower rating, and especially it gives you know, a different color code red, too. Yeah, it's, it's a different it's color a little code more as well. worrisome. And to yeah, throw um, another wrench in it, no pun intended. <laughs> there is, uh, there's going to be like Apple has like their name recognition, and if Apple ships their phones out there and they get a one out of ten, I think people care less about the repairability score because they know the good phone has a one out of ten, so it must not mean much. Does that make sense? I, I kind of disagree with that. Really? Yeah. Okay. I think that, I mean, I think people buy iPhones because they've always bought iPhones, right? I've talked to people who had an LG phone and I was like, oh, wow, like, you're using, I don't see a lot of people using LG phones. And they just say, I've used LG phones since the flip phones. And so, like, people stick with what they know. But I do think that, like, putting this information in their face when directly compared against something right next to it does have an impact on people. And, like, it's very hard to sway people off of platforms. And I think a lot of people will just stay on the iPhone even if it has a 1 out of 10 and the Fairphone's right next to it with a 9 out of 10. Yeah. But I think there will be a sizable amount of people who would at least think about it. Yeah, I think there's there are people, I guess there's, like, two types of shoppers. There's shoppers that go into the store knowing what they want. Ah, my iPhone's getting kind of old. Part of it's broken. I'm going to the store to get the new iPhone. Tell me where the store is, son. I'm going to get a new iPhone from the Verizon store. And they walk in and they're like, which one's the new one? I'll buy it. And it has a 1 out of 10. And they go, oh, okay. Oh, well. I really? guess I'm getting a 1 out of 10. I really think that would make that's, an impact That's on one type of person. Okay, okay. The other type of person is going in ready to cross shop. And they're going to go, I would like a big screen phone. I don't know which one yet, but I would like a big screen phone. And they walk in and there's three or four big screen phones and they might ask a question or two and they might shop around and pick two of them up. And one of them has a higher score than the other. That person's probably going to think about that score a little more. But I think there's a lot of people who you say buy LG, 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 LG because they're familiar. And even if they recognize something's not that great about it, at least they know LG stuff. And there's a lot of iPhone users who are just on that track and they just know their iP- their AirPods are going to work and then the Mac is going to work with it and they're just going to get an iPhone and that's what they're here for. And oh, it's got a 1 out of 10. This other phone's got a 10 out of 10, but it doesn't work with my AirPods. I don't really care. So I think those people will see the scores and go, I guess 1 out of 10 is not so bad because the iPhone just works with all my stuff already. So I'm curious what type of effect those stickers may or may not have on those groups of people, but that's just a thought. Like you said, I think that it's it's extremely dependent on the type of customer. Yeah. But but I I still think that it will have an effect on all customers, whether or not it actually changes the customers that just know what they want. I don't know, but at least they'll think about it for a hot second. It's like when you watch a documentary of it's like you watch that documentary about like how bo- bad McDonald's is for you, and then everyone's like, "I'm a vegan now," and then the next day they're eating and McDonald's six again. Months later, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's this is one more really good Lewis Rossman point, which is 
I don't think most people know it's an issue until they're, it's it, you know long after they bought it, and that's part of it. So I think they care after they've had the experience. So you know, when someone brings me a machine that's like four thousand bucks, and I say this would usually be a three hundred dollar repair, but the manufacturer don't won't, doesn't allow me to get this chip, so you got to buy a new one. That that sticks with them, and then the next time they'll say I care about this. But I don't. Most people don't care until they're made aware of it as a problem, or just like most problems. You know, most people don't care until it personally affects them. And so, if you go your whole life never having to replace a single part in your car, you honestly probably don't care how repair, repairable or replaceable the parts are, or tech for that matter, or, or your tractor, whatever. If it works, it works. This is probably why John Deere has so much leverage, is because their tractors are probably really good. They're really good. If the repairability thing is such a big problem, buy a different tractor would be a really good answer. But John Deere stuff is so good and so dominant that people just keep using that stuff. But when the day finally comes where something breaks and you actually do have to repair something, you're going to care a lot more about right to repair, about how repairable the thing is that you bought, about the repairability score you ignored before. All that stuff comes right to the top and you'd, you'd be a right to repair advocate from nothing yeah. as soon as something needs to be replaced. That's, so It's so funny because when, when we think about it, I think you can actually make the analogy that John Deere is basically the apple of tractors, right? Like they make the one – I don't actually know any other tractor companies when I try to think off the top of my head. If someone said name a tractor company, I'd say John Deere. I was say Tonka. I don't even know if they make tractors. I don't even know. And so like – and I think that's how a lot of consumers feel in the U.S. People say, oh, give me your iPhone, but they don't – you know, nobody knows what OnePlus is unless you're like in the tech community, right? So it's kind of like – yeah, and at the same time, they make really good stuff that works with all its parts. They have an app on your phone that will tell you, like, what parts of the tractor are having issues, if you can fix it yourself and all this stuff. And it's, like, very high tech, very this, this. Um, but yet, they at the end of the day, they control the ecosystem. And yeah. it's really similar in that way. Yeah, that's yeah. that's always uh, – it always comes back to the illusion of choice. Yeah. Where it's like, <laughs> listen, you don't like the way we do things? Buy a different one. Tesla's like, you don't like the way we handle repairs with our electric cars? Fine. Buy a different one. Yeah. Guess how much fun you're going to have. Yeah. Not as much. You don't want to buy a John you don't Deere tractor? You don't want to buy, bro, buy another tractor. <laughs> what other tractor? What other tractor? Oh, yeah. Exactly. So if you're out here buying phones and you realize at the end of the day, Apple has a lot of leverage and a lot of control and people are just here for the iPhone anyway, they can, this is something I talk about all the time, they can use their good product as leverage for bad behavior. And this is just another one of those examples of anti-right to repair is just another bad behavior that people are willing sometimes to deal with because the iPhone is so good to them. Right. I think that's basically Until it. Until it breaks. Until it breaks. Yep. Then, then we uh, revisit the right to repair video yeah. that Marquez made and how it's, angry It's are. that extreme frustration of like, oh, I hate them as a company, but oh, their product is so good. That's what everybody feels about Apple, and that's pretty much what these farmers feel about John Deere too. Product is king. Product is king. Well, yeah, I think that's that's kind of the moral of the story. I think, honestly, if you were to distill pretty much every video I make into like one sentence, it would be like, how good the product is is the only thing that matters. And when we talk about right to repair, the only reason it's an issue is because people still keep wanting to buy these things despite their poor repairability scores. And there's going to be little features that are bad in otherwise great products, and people are still going to want to buy the otherwise great product. There's always going to be stuff that comes up to make you question the overall quality of an, a usually pretty great product and how important each of these factors is to you is going to determine how important you know the overall product experience is to you. But generally, typically, product is king. And if you make a good product, everything else comes after that. You know, at the end of the day, we have to worry about the limited resources that we have. So it, it's a question of safety. Um, people's lives are not replaceable. Um, people's limbs are not replaceable yet. <laughs> um, so it's a question of safety and humanity at the end of the day. It's more ethics than it is legality. And we need to worry about holding, you know, people above above money. And that's that's just that's that will always be the answer to every question. Yeah. 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 And people can't really question that either, right? Yeah. Well, that's been it. I, I feel like we've talked our faces off again, yeah, yeah, which is yeah. pretty yeah. good for uh, Waveform. But we'll be back next week with a, a more uh, regularly structured episode of Current Events. Let us know Unless what you think. Unless something crazy comes out. I mean, yeah. there's always <laughs> a knows? chance. But uh, there's, there's plenty of videos planned on all of the channels. So let us know what you think of this 
type of this this style round of table. yeah round table a format if you will um there's always room to edit and improve but you can discuss it on the new discord channel you can discuss Whoa. it on discord we are on youtube so you can leave it in the comment section you can tweet at us now we're all so many platforms this is great may wow. the best platform win uh all right that's been it talk to you guys later peace